I can find it. Yeah, if I can find it. Well, All right, folks, uh, that is not our normal intro, but it's been a crazy week for me, and I am going to try and bring my A game, but if I bring my B game, I apologize. So, let me, uh, since the intro was not done, I want to introduce my fantastic, awesome, stellar co-host, the man who makes Treader Trolls cry. And mops the floors with their tears. Jack Bears! Hello. And then she's smart. She's intelligent. She's Jack's girlfriend, but we don't hold that against her. She will melt your brain with her geek knowledge. Alicia A B P. Yay! <laughs> so, folks. We are uh, today talking about basically silent to talkies, and we picked three um, different people to talk about. And we have awesome timelines. We have awesome information. We hope you all enjoy. So um, let's see. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this blown up. Get it blown up bigger. There we go. All right. So, uh, I guess we're talking about Charlie Chaplin first, right? Yes. Well, you brought up the shared screen first. Okay. <laughs> so, so, all right. So, <clears throat> I am, yeah, I'm covering Charlie Chaplin, and uh, we'll start when he was born. Charles Spencer Chaplin was born on April, oops, April 16th, 1889, possibly in the East Walworth in South London. They actually do not have his... Uh, his his birth certificate is like his birth certificate's been lost, so they don't know for sure. But uh, according to Charlie himself, that's the information. <laughs> so when he was pretty young, his mother Hannah started uh, going crazy, and so they committed her to Cane Hill, uh, which is a mental asylum for two months. This is uh, Charlie around that time, and then. In 1900, his father dies. That's a picture of his father. And then his mother has to go back to Cane Hill for a second time. This is a picture of Cane Hill. Uh, and then because his parents were performers, he started doing performing himself. So this was his first performance. You have to excuse me. This was his first performance, uh, Jim, A Romance of Cockney. And he was given the role of a newsboy. Um, and um, he would also afterwards play Billy the Page Boy in Sherlock Holmes. And he would go on three national tours. This is him as the Page Boy in Sherlock Holmes. So, you see he's a young boy there. Um, his mother goes back to Cane Hill. This time it's permanent. Um, Did they ever... Uh explain what her diagnosis was i mean i know we're talking about look as someone who knows mental illness very well from experience in all forms this was a very archaic time for mental mental illness yeah i mean oh, it was sure. so but uh yeah it was so they probably didn't treat her very well um so uh, Chaplin joins the juvenile act Casey's Circus and ends up being the star of the show. This is uh, Chaplin right here in the middle with the with the with the little famous hat. Um, he then starts a two week trial at Fred Carno's Comedy Company, and after his first night, he they sign a contract because he's that good, and that's Carno. So he starts doing the vaudeville circuits. And the second time he he does the uh, United uh, uh, the second United States vaudeville circuit, he uh, about six months into it. Um, this is the vaudeville circuit. This is a picture of the newspaper. You see Charles Chaplin. 
And um, six months in, he signs a, a deal with the New York Motion Picture Company where he would work for Keystone Studios. And uh, this is a picture of Keystone Studios. So he flies to Los Angeles to work for Keystone Studios in 1913. Now, this mountain, <clears throat> the, the specific reason why I chose this mountain, this is what the mountain would have looked like around this time, around the 1913. It wouldn't be about, it wouldn't be, it's called Mount Lee, and it wouldn't be until about the 1920s when somebody would put a Hollywood land sign on it, and then they would level the top. Originally, they leveled the top to make a mansion for somebody, but then the, uh, the Great Depression hit, and so... They never built the house, but they leveled the land. So they ended up putting the large antenna there. So that later on becomes where the Hollywood signs located. It would, it would have been located right around here. No shit. <laughs> so. <clears throat> you didn't get the house, but you got Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts so working more. for Keystone. So his very first movie is called Making a Living. Uh, it was released on... Uh, February 2nd, 1914. And <clears throat> he's he's not playing the tramp in this point. He's just playing a, a different character. It wouldn't be until his second movie that came out where the tramp would be introduced. And it's called Kid uh, Kid Auto Races at Venice. And this is like a week later. Like he back then, like he he was putting out stuff weekly, which is why there's a large chunk of stuff going on in, in that timeline but this was a pretty funny one i did i did uh watch this one and uh it's it's like a it looks it starts off like a almost like a documentary like they're documenting these auto races and then eventually like you start seeing charlie or the tramp in this case um uh in the background trying to get as much camera time as possible and then event you know at 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 some point he just starts stepping right in front of the camera <laughs> and this is this is a picture of him like stepping right in front of the camera <laughs> like, while while he's they're trying to film the crowd and he just walks in right in front it's pretty <laughs> photo it's pretty bomb and before photo bomb was popular <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a good one so he makes he makes some more films and then he signs on with a different uh studio uh yeah, so he ended up leaving Keystone over contract negotiations because he wanted a thousand dollars a week, and the studio was like, "No, we're not going to pay you that." So SNA Film Manufacturing Company offered Charlie one thousand two hundred fifty dollars a week plus a ten thousand dollars signing bonus. So Jesus Christ, back in which, that day, yeah, he, he like he was that talented. I mean, and then he had that work ethic too because you could see like he was putting stuff out every week. Mm -hmm. And then he also recruited uh, Ed, Edna Purviance or per, uh, per, Purveyance per as a leading, thank you as a, as a leading lady, and they would have a romantic relationship until 1917. Um, let's see, yeah. So Mutual Film would be his next uh, company he'd work for. He signs a contract. Um. He wanted a hundred and fifty thousand dollar signing bonus, and so they offered him that and ten thousand dollars a week. Ten thousand dollars a week—that's that's a lot for even today. So, yes. Yeah, but a, especially back then in the twenties and the, the teens. I mean, yeah, that that means he he had name recognition like all hell. Mm -hmm. He did. There was some stuff where I skipped where it's like um, he, he, he started like there started to be merchandise. He had a doll of himself as the tramp. <laughs> I skipped a lot of that because there's a lot. We don't have the time. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did he come up with the I, did, Is he like one of the originals who came up with likeness rights? I don't know about that. I, I, I didn't read. I didn't find out anything about that. But this is that picture I was talking about. <laughs> 
He look his face is like he, he doesn't. It, it almost looks like he doesn't know what to think of it. This is like uh, this is kind of flattering, but also a little creepy. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, it'd be a lot creepier if he knew what was coming up of uh, about twenty years later. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We know all about that. So then he starts working for First National. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the deal was eight films for $1 million. Damn. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> yeah, now, now he's, like, obviously he, he's, he's Buka rich now, um, especially for that time. And then this oh. is just a, a paper clip of it. Well, think about this. When you're talking about that time frame, I mean, that basically he was a superstar. Yes, he was. In fact, they even gave him money to build his own studio. <laughs> so this is his studio that uh, that's that was uh, that's off Sunset Boulevard. I think it still exists. And um, this is where he made his video, his movies from from here on until about the 1950s. Very so, nice. uh, let's see. Skip some of the. Okay, so then he uh, he meets uh, Mildred Harris and marries her when she's sixteen. <laughs> okay, okay. I want to point this out. That was not uncommon back in that day. My grandfather right. was twenty. My great grandfather was twenty five when he married uh, my sixteen year old granny. Yeah, but this like once he gets like in his thirties, it gets really uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you get. <laughs> I, I don't so, know. I, I don't know. I've I've got several members of my family that have married uh, younger people. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just it's not a big deal to us. Okay. And so from from that relationship, Norman Spencer Chaplin was born. Unfortunately, he was malformed and died three years later. This is nineteen nineteen, mm -hmm. July nineteen nineteen. I mean days, three days, not years, darling. Did I say years? I'm sorry. Three days. Um, oh. And this is his. This is his grave. It doesn't actually have his name on it. It it, it says the the little mouse, July seventh to July tenth, nineteen nineteen. Poor little baby. So after that happened, that they, they didn't really get along afterwards. So by April nineteen twenty, they got divorced. This is a picture of him around that time. And then the kid was released on this date. This was a pretty funny movie. He meets May Collins. And uh, First National announces the engagement of Charlie and uh, his secretary, Mary Collins. By June, Charlie would have second thoughts and would start calling off work with the flu. And the engagement was eventually called off. So, yeah, he wouldn't he didn't even want to deal with her, like be in the same room with her. So he would call off work. <laughs> he would, he would wow. call her. He would call because he's the second. She's his secretary. He would call her at work and just be like, I'm not coming in. I'm sick. Talk about ghost and their girlfriend. Jeez. And, and she knew he wasn't sick. Yeah. So. Uh, let's see. So then he meets another one named Lita Gray. And uh, yeah, they, dis they, they discreetly marry in Mexico. She was 16 and he was 35. So, yeah. Well, that he liked them young. Yeah, yep. to say the least. And then from that, <laughs> Charles Spencer Chaplin was born. This is what he looks like, looked like as an adult. Uh, May 25. And then uh, this is when the Gold Rush was released. This is uh, that famous scene where he's eating his boot. Oh, yes. And eventually in June... 1925 he was uh, on time magazine so now now he's like very well recognized yeah and then sydney earl chaplin was born and uh may 30th 1926 sorry i don't have pictures of all these people um unhappy with the marriage charlie would spend most of his time in the studio so instead of calling in sick because 
she wasn't working for him, he would just spend all his time in the studio this time. <laughs> Trying to avoid her instead of coming home. Lita got tired of this and took the kids and left. Lita's divorce application was leaked to the press and people were calling to ban his movies. Charlie would settle with Lita for $600,000. Oh, damn. That's a lot back then. Mm-hmm. Oh, but by now he's like, yeah, he's, he's, he can, he can uh, afford that now. Oh, yeah, and then, absolutely. And then the circus was released on this date. And the circus was so popular that the uh, first Academy Awards ceremony uh, awarded Charlie with an honorary Oscar for writing, uh, acting, directing, and producing the circus. And this is his Oscar, his honorary Oscar for the circus. Um, and then his mother dies in uh, Cane Hill Mental Asylum in uh, August 28, 1928. That's her. City Lights was released on this date. This is the first movie where uh, he composed uh, his own music. So January 30th, 1931. Uh, This was a weird thing that happened. So Charlie decided to take a break and travel for 16 months. At one point, he traveled to Japan and uh, an attempted coup coup d'etat took place while he was there involving the Imperial Japanese Navy uh, junior officers. And with the help of two other groups, they assassinated Japanese Prime Minister, I can't pronounce that name. Inyaki Tashirashi. Thank you. And uh, so they originally wanted to uh, wanted Charlie to, to be with them so that they can assassinate him too. Uh, with the intention of starting a war with the U.S., they thought killing Charlie Chaplin would start a war with Japan. <laughs> but Charlie was watching sumo wrestling with his son and uh, with, with the the son of the prime minister at the time. So he wasn't there. And uh, when the attempted coup d'etat amounted to nothing, the group of 11 officers turned themselves in. And they actually got light sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a weird incident that sort of involved Charlie. Um, Modern Times was released on March 13, 1936. Um after this release, uh, they, uh, Charlie and Paulette took a trip to the Far East and got married in Canton. And it's modern times. And then he comes out with uh, The Great Dictator in October 15th, 1940. <laughs> That's where I was going with the mustache thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. so like uh, this, is, this is actually his first talkie. Uh, he avoided doing talkies for a long time, and then, like, he finally gave in, and he, this was the first one where uh, there, it, there's sound and talking. Uh, so he, he's always had, he's always, they've always, here's the thing about Charlie and Adolf Hitler. They, they are, they are born four days apart, and they, and they both were, they both came from poverty, mm-hmm. and they both have the, the, the little tooth toothpick mustache or whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. So like, so Charlie decided one day, like, let's make fun of that. And he, he does the Hitler thing. But at the end of this thing, he actually, there's he, at the end of this thing, like, the greatest speech like, I've ever heard. He does the Hitler thing. But at the end of this thing, he actually, there's he, at the end of this thing, okay, there's the there thing, the greatest speech I've ever heard. Is everything? I, getting a, whoa. I don't. I don't know where the echoes went. Came from. Uh, that wasn't just an echo. That was like a re. That wasn't just an echo. That was a repeat. That was. That was weird. Okay. Sorry about that. Weird. So. Now remember, Charlie is married, but now he starts having an affair with someone called Joan Barry until about autumn of 1942. This is where he really starts to get in trouble. In 1943, Joan claimed to be came back and claimed to be pregnant with Charles' baby. Chaplin denied the claim, and Joan filed a paternity suit. And this is where the FBI starts investigating him. And um, okay, so I, I have to say that the FBI file on Charlie Chaplin is unbelievable. <laughs> it is uh, mm-hmm. 
it's 10 parts. There's, there's 10 PDFs and Ooh. each one is about 300 pages long. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, so they, they, they decide uh, to charge him with four indictments, including transporting a woman across state boundaries for sexual purposes, which, which would have been Joan Barry. He, he flew her to New York for like a premiere and then, you know, did their thing. And apparently that's a crime. <laughs> mm. So eventually um, a romance developed between him and Una O'Neill. Uh, and on June 16th, 1943, they eloped. And this is her. And this is now his fourth wife, by the way, at this point. And uh, this will be his last wife. They, like, they, they, uh, uh, this will be his widow. <coughs> so, Carol Ann Berry was born. It's, this was the baby that, that, uh, Jean Barry claims is Charlie's baby. Man Act trial in which Charlie was indicted for transporting women across state boundaries for sexual purposes began on March 22nd, 1944 and ended April 4th, 1944 with Charlie's acquittal. So he got acquitted for that. Oh, and then Una and Charles have their first baby, Geraldine Chaplin. The first of like seven, I think. Sounds about right, yeah. And uh, With some busy bunnies. Oh, yes. Jo Joan <laughs> Barry's paternity suit went to court in uh, December 1944. Charlie was found to be the father and was ordered to pay child support until she was 21. So that uh, that he got smeared in the press for that, too. And then they had their second baby. And then in September 9th, 1946, an FBI memo requests that their files about Charlie Chaplin be reviewed. A second memo dated September 22nd talked of a clipping from the New York Post indicating that Charlie was to be subpoenaed to testify before the Un-American Activities Committee. A third one dated March 1st, 1947 said Charlie's name appeared in Louis Branston's address book. And then this is the, this is the memo saying like, review your shit on Charlie Chaplin. Um, now he, he got smeared so much that when this movie came out, it was one of his first box office bombs. I, I'm not even going to pronounce the name. Monsieur do. Thank you. So you're welcome. And you then seem, uh, you seem to know your uh, Latin or French. Oh. French. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was gonna. I say learned it when I was very little. I learned it when I was very little. I was five years old, so I ha I better learn it, know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Josephine Chaplin was born in 1948. Jesus Let's Christ! How along. many kids does this guy have? Eleven total. Uh, <laughs> Victoria Chaplin was born in uh, May 19th, 1951, and then. So he wanted to premiere his next movie, Limelight, in London. And so he left for London on a ship in September 18th, 1952. And then the following day, his re-entry permit was revoked by the U.S. Attorney General. And uh, they said, like, before you can come back, you have to, uh, you, you, you have to, like, we have to interview you and blah, 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 blah. And he didn't want to go through that. So he decided to cut all his ties with the U.S., so Limelight came out on this day on uh, October 23rd, 1952. It's uh, Charlie actually shares a scene with Buster Keaton in it. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to point that out. And then Charlie went to the U S embassy in Switzerland in 1953 and surrendered his reentry permit. By now he had already moved his family to a new home in Switzerland or yeah, in Switzerland put his kids in school, sold his estate in Hollywood, and shipped his furniture overseas. So he has no intention of returning. And then this is the FBI memo where, like, he, they first um, say that. Uh, in uh, June 5th, 1954, Chaplin's awarded the International Peace Prize by the World Peace Council. And this is him accepting it. Uh, he sells his 
the remainder of his stock in United Artists in 1955. And this is, this is where he completely severs all ties to the U.S. And then he has some more kids. <laughs> he releases a, a new movie called Kings of New York. It would be uh, his first one shot abroad after his exile. And then he would start re-releasing some of his older stuff with, uh, with, with uh, uh, soundtracks. Uh, so this is the Chaplin Review. It's just a re-release of A Dog's Life. Shoulder Arms and The Pilgrim is some of his early stuff. Uh, and then he has another kid, Annette Champlin. And then he has another kid, Christopher Chaplin. This this is his last kid. And um, June 8, 1962 is when he was born. Um, so, unfortunately... How old is he now? And, and he, wait a minute. It's 1962 and he's still having kids. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Like, I... I I feel kind of bad because like this, this picture cropped out, like he, but there's seven kids and then like Una and Charlie in the middle. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. So he lived happily ever after, after his exile, if you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> exile, exile, nothing to him. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, the, uh, Countess from Hong Kong was released on this date. It would be Charlie's final on-screen appearance in 1967. And then in April 10th, 1972, Charlie was awarded with an os honorary Oscar for, quote, the incalculable effect he has had in making motion pictures the art form of the century, uh, which was in the 44th Academy Award. Remember, he got his first one in the first Academy Award. Now here it is 44 years later. <laughs> yeah, but the key uh, thing you you mentioned was these are honorary; these aren't actual. Little... True, true. Mm -hmm. But um, so Charlie was allowed to return to the United States to accept the award. He was greeted with a twelve minute standing ovation, which made him emotional. This is this was him like taking in the, all that applause, like, and uh, you know, he afterwards he goes to the microphone. And he doesn't really have much to say other than thank you and your beautiful people. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, they give, they give him a little bowl hat and a cane. And like, he tries to, he tries to do his little, uh, thing where he pops the, the hat off his head. It was, it was really cute. Yeah. I'm going to have was, to look that up. Oh yeah, definitely. You, you, you will love that. Um, and then in January 1st, 1975, Charlie was awarded with the title of Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, KBE, by Queen Elizabeth II. And um, by now he had been having strokes and uh, it had messed with his health and he couldn't he couldn't stand for a very long time. So he uh, he took the knighthood while he was uh, sitting in a wheelchair. Oh, wow. And then. Finally, in December 25th, Christmas, December 25th, 1977, Charlie died of a stroke while he was in his sleep at 88 years old. His funeral was two days later, and he was buried at uh, Cor oh, man. Casiosa de Valle. <laughs> Thank you. Cemetery. <laughs> Three months later, grave rotters stole his coffin and held it for Ramson in hopes that his now widow Una would pay for them to get it back. But they were, you know, authorities caught him two months later, and Charlie was reburied, this time in a reinforced concrete vault. And that's his grave. Damn. That's a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The end. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. we... we... I gotta figure this thing out real quick. Yeah, that's his lifespan right there. Okay, so who's next? Uh, your girlfriend, of course. <laughs> okay, let's see. Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. All right, Miss Shirley Temple. So. 
Shirley Temple, let's start with Miss Shirley Temple, the good ship lollipop. So Shirley Temple was born, Shirley Temple was born on April 23rd, 1928 in Santa Monica Hospital, which is now the UCLA Medical Center. She was the third child. Her mother was a homemaker, Gertrude, and her father was a bank employee, George. She also had two brothers, John and George Jr. And then later the family moves to LA. And that is little Miss Shirley. Uh, you're going to need to scroll up, darling, for the one that we need to do. Where it's called a hair style that changed her life. Now, this is Shirley when she's about two years old. Now, her mother has enrolled Shirley into a school where basically these children are taught dancing, they're taught singing, they're taught acting. So around this time, her mother starts styling her hair in the iconic ringlet style that she does. And this is little Shirley at about two years of age. So she, she's so freaking adorable. <laughs> and let's see. And around this time when she starts doing that, that she gets some notice. Uh, let's see. I think you need to go over where it says glad to riches, please. So while she's in this dance school, she's noticed by a casting director and she's basically, he notices that this girl's got potential. Now, remember, she's only about two years of age, but they're putting these kids that from this acting school, they're putting them in a lot of shorts that are basically very similar to actual movies that were being made like by Mae West. And she basically appears, even though she's only two in these roles and they put a lot of these kids in these adult type roles of sorts like that. And if they were not doing what they were supposed to. The kids were severely punished where they were put into this silence. Basically, they were put like almost like in solitary confinement. Now, these kids were basically treated as an adult, even though they're only toddlers at this point. So that's crazy. But yeah, that is Shirley. She's about three years of age now. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we need to go where it says signs Fern's contract, please. So she's spotted there and she's basically, she's in these 10 minute films and there's commentary shorts and basically all these kids from this particular studio, they're appearing in the shorts, a lot of them are. So the guy notices her and he says, oh, this girl's kind of cute. I see she's got potential. So they put these kids in a lot of different roles. And that's Shirley again. And around this time, I mean, like I said, she looks much older, but I think the studios had her lie about her age to make her seem like she's younger. That way people won't find out her actual age. One of her roles, what she was in, was in this thing called Kid in Africa. Basically, it's sort of similar from what I was doing the research, where it's similar to Tarzan, but that's Shirley. She's basically just playing a little role like that, where they're just acting like adults basically <laughs> at this point uh let's see the runt page so around this time she's starting to get more notes from the studios and stuff like that and basically a lot of these are still juvenile actors as you can see they're doing also these commercials and stuff like that so they're dressing these kids basically as adults and sometimes they'll even put these kids like in this role if you see the full photo these kids are practically just in diapers sadly they're just uh, I, treating hope I, them. A strike. I, I hope i don't get a strike for it's for child nudity <laughs> Hope not either, but yeah, it's a little problematic. But yeah, because of this, they're starting to notice her where she's going to be eventually noticed where she starts doing 20 minute films instead of these 10 minute ones. <laughs> so from there, yeah, she goes into this thing. We, I, I'm just hoping we don't get a strike for that. <laughs> I hope not. But then it goes into this thing called uh, Frolics of Youth, where basically during that point, she starts appearing in these roles and they have her with more well-known actors of that period so she plays a character named mary lou rogers she's the baby sister of the main actor in this and also she's also doing more and more commercials at this point for breakfast cereals and everything also during this time she appears in her first movie called the last man so there's not a whole lot of information about this one but she does appear in that one 
And this one, she actually, she's not credited, but she's also known as this character who, the doll you see in her hands, she's known as the little kid whose doll's head gets shot off, literally. So that's why people remembered her. Saying, oh, that's Shirley Temple. She's the little kid that had her doll's head blown off. So, yeah. <laughs> and she also appears in her first movie called The Red-Haired Alibi. There's not too much about this movie. We just know that she's a that's her first feature film at this point. But she's basically that's her first feature role. This film did not appear in color, even though the photo is in color. So, yes. So, she's getting ready to sign her first contract at this point. And Yes, yeah, she, yeah, she, but she signs her first contract with the MGM. Well, not MGM per se. So uh, let's see. You need to go to. Let's see. Uh, stand up and cheer. That's where we need to go. So Fox is noticing her and they had seen her with her stuff like that. So they start creating more and more roles for her to play. So. Her films typically were $150 per film that she was going to do, and she was guaranteed for two weeks with Fox. And they started creating roles just for her. Most of her roles were very fluffy kind of things. They wanted her to be kind of like the one that was helping reunite her estranged parents, smoothing out wrinkles, helping couples fall in love with each other. And she basically is given certain roles. One of the roles that she was given that was specifically designed for her was one of the roles called Bright Eyes. That was specifically written for her, but she wanted to be a tomboy during this time, but because they said, no, we don't want you to be a tomboy, so she has to wear this ringlets all the time, and that was very painful for young Shirley at this point. Her mom has to basically curl it every night and rinse it in vinegar and it causes severe burns for poor Shirley also at this time. So she's basically starting to do films. Uh, I think you need to go to, let me see look what I'm, where I need you to go. So her salary is going to increase in 1935. And her mom is also her personal hairdresser at this point. And because of this, she also does 11 movies in the course of a couple years. So her salary has increased by this point. It's basically increased from being the $1,000 to $2,500 per week. Her mother is hired to be her personal hairstylist. And then during this time, she's also given the chance to do the movie and color which will appear later on but she will basically she's considered the cute little girl that everybody loves she also gets a chance to do 11 movies in the course of about two years and during that time she will get her own private bungalow she'll get a private tutor she'll get a bodyguard at this point now during this point she's also starting to get notice of some of these studio executives so these are pictures of her at her bungalow as you can see it's got a swing that she could play from she had a private little living room area she had her own tutor where she taught her from the school there she has her own private little car that she can drive herself around if she wants to as you can see she's got her own little telephone that phone actually did work <laughs> that's her in the school area of the bungalow now this bungalow was actually owned by walt disney at one point and owned at the studio but it was sold later because her parents want her to focus more on her studies. But right now, this is Shirley's bungalow right now. And how old is Shirley Temple at this point? She's about five years old at this point right now. She's about five years old at this point. Five, Even though they want to make her seem like she's four, that she's only about maybe at the most five, six, six years of age. Also, during this point, she also gets her, the chance to get her handprints and an honorary Oscar at this point as well. So on February 1935, she receives a juvenile Oscar of her film accomplishment. As you can see, her Oscar is a little bit smaller than the regular Oscars and everything like that. And then a month later, she gets to do her handprints and feet prints into the Gaiman Theater. So that is her handprints and footprints with her little signatures and love to you all Shirley Temple. It looks so tiny. I know. 
I know, it's so tiny. Okay. So her movies are not going to do so well right now. There's, the ratings are starting to drop now at, at this point now, sadly. I mean, the contract is getting ready to change. So the executive exe are switching things around that they're noticing the things are not doing as well where she's not normally the top rated movies anymore. But they decide to give her a chance to maybe be in The Wizard of Oz, which is by MGM. But unfortunately, that falls that flops and it doesn't go through so instead she appears in this movie called Susanna of the Mounties instead there was a rumor that she was supposed to have been traded for Jean Harlow to go into the Wizard of Oz film but there's no proof to this rumor they just said it's maybe it happened but it didn't so unfortunately poor Shirley did not appear in the Wizard of Oz even though she wanted to be Uh, yeah, so she has two more flops, sadly, at this point, and her contract is going to change. And now she's 12 years of age, and her parents have bought out the remainder of her schooling, and she's basically no longer going to be taught by a private tutor like she was before. So she appears in this movie called The Bluebird, and then she will also appear in a movie called The Young People, and then she will be into a private schooling called The West Lake school which is in LA and that is Shirley in her school so this is now about 1940s Shirley is no longer considered the cute little girl anymore so she's trying to transition into her teen years almost also during this time she appears on radio as well so while she's on radio she's also being the voice for this CBS series called Junior Miss and that debuted on March 4th, 1942, where she played the title role. It was based on a musical kind of thing. So the series would continue on past Shirley, but Shirley was one of the first ones to appear in that radio drama. Sounds like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Kind of like, kind of like. So she had tries again with her MGM, but MGM, so this is where it gets a little problematic. One of the executives exposed himself to young Shirley. I won't go into too many details, but he exposed himself to her. Shirley innocently giggles about it. And so he basically fires Shirley for the giggles that she does. And so, they fire her from MGM and she decides to focus mostly on her schooling. So she tries to appear in a couple projects, but unfortunately none of them fall through. So yeah, like I said, the executive had a little bit got offended because of Shirley's giggles. Why you didn't watch her movies? <laughs> I think he had, but I think he expected her to be a little bit more adult. So she signs one more contract at that point where she's going to be appear in these more adult teenager roles. One of them is called Since You Went Away. And she also appears in a movie with Cary Grant. And there was also a movie she appeared in called Kiss and Tell. And she also at this point has fallen in love with her first husband, who is at least five years older than her. That's her and Cary Grant in that movie that, together. And then below that is her first husband and her. So they got married. She's only about 17 at this point, and he's about 22. He was actually in the military, but he also appeared with her in two of the roles. That's how they met each other at the studio. So this is one of their wedding photos from that year in 1947. So yeah, she gets married to him. Um, I think you need to go where it says, yeah, John Adger, please. So this is John. So this wedding that she has with John at this point, there's about 500 people invited to this wedding at this point. <laughs> I mean, it's like a big deal. Everybody goes to this wedding. I mean, those are just some of the photos I was able to find. It's like, it's insane. Everybody that was anybody attended Shirley's wedding. 
But and keep in mind, she's only 17 at this point. And Agar is 22. So, yeah. <laughs> she also has a child by Agar. The only child she would have by him. She has a daughter, Susan. And eventually she and Agar will divorce each other. And she gains custody of her daughter by herself. And she eventually tries to do more acting a little bit. But she meets someone along the way. She meets her second husband, Charles Black, after her divorce. And he was basically a World War II Navy intelligence officer. And he was also one of the people that helped make her transition out of the Hollywood phase. So she slowly transitioned herself out of Hollywood at this point. So that is Shirley and husband number two. And she also has two children by him. She has Charles and she also has Susan. So Charles is her second child. That's cute little Charles Jr. And that is her daughter, Susan. Susan is also, um, she also has a, her daughter has, is also in a band. So if you ever hear about this singer, I believe if you scroll up, darling, it has about Susan. No, Lori. Sorry, not Lori. Lori is her second child that she had with Charles. So Lori is her second child that she has in 1954. And if you scroll down a little bit, you can see what Lori looks like. She is part of a rock band. So Shirley Temple's daughter is a rock star in many ways. <laughs> She's the bassist of that group. I forget the name exactly. And also, at this point, she's getting ready to leave acting. So go to the end of an era, please. Go up. Yep. So she has had these movies that she did in 47 and 49, and she basically officially retired from films on December 16, 1950. But she does do one more acting project right after this, which will be known as the Shirley Temple Storybook. So it's going to be a little bit reminiscent of her acting that she did before, when she was still a child. And she basically will appear in this, the mean character in 1958 to 1961. She hosted, she narrates these storybooks, tales, where she basically plays the lead in many of these. Unfortunately, there was a lot of other shows at this point where they were in syndication that were competing against her at that time slot including Mickey Mouse with the Walt Disney series that he was doing, Wizard of Oz miniseries kind of thing, Lassie, Maverick. So this is going to be her last project that she does. The last thing she does after this, even though it's not listed on my timeline, she did go into politics, but she did sadly die in 2014 at the age of 77. But she had a massive career, as you can see, as a child and as an adult, she chose not to act. So that is where Shirley is buried. Oh, it's very pretty. Mm-hmm. Yes. I like that one, yeah. I do, too. I do, too. I thought it was very pretty as well. But, yep. And that is Miss Shirley Temple. Now, unfortunately, I was not able, due to an ungodly number of health issues today, to uh, or this week, to put a, a time yeah I, I didn't even get the timeline name right i just put new mm. timeline and just it saved it as that but um yeah i'm gonna talk a little bit about buster keaton uh buster keaton was born october the 4th um 1895 in Pekeka, in Pekeka, kansas uh, one of the things about his life was, you know, he was born to, and something uh, Jack said uh, with Charlie Chapman, those, uh, and I'm going to probably say it wrong, the Vandaliers. Vandaliers. Yeah, those kind of people. Um, so at age four, Keaton was already acting with his parents. His parents were already comedians. 
they were already doing this stuff. So he got an interest in it and he stuck with it and he went with it. And his parents were very supportive, uh, I guess, of him doing it. And like I said, at the age of four, Keaton is already doing his acting career. Uh, their stage gained an amazing reputation. Uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, Buster Stars Comedy at Four. Uh, sorry, Jack, I know I kind of put you on the wire there. Uh, yeah, the Three Keens. So, what happened there is, and like I said, I apologize, I've got to go through the paperwork here. So his father, um, unfortunately, became a heavy alcoholic, and they had to break up the uh, they had to break up the the band, for lack of a better term. And uh, and you know he went to New York, and he ran also. Something I meant to mention. Uh, yeah, we'll get to the Butcher Boy and just say one of the things I wanted to say is there was this thing. Uh, the reason why he's called Buster is because his dad, when he he fell one time, and his dad, um, not his dad, his dad coined a phrase from Harry Houdini. Because when he fell, his dad said that was a buster. And his dad coined that with him. And that's why the term Buster Keaton came about. Uh, and he was in New York uh, and had a, trunch, had a run in with uh, Lucky Shot with Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, uh, which resulted in inventing him to be his upcoming short the butcher boy and that's really what kind of started his career off um at his peak he was making about two movies a year uh when it came to his feature films uh, in 1921, he married his first wife, Natalie, uh, and I do not know how to say this, last, Tamanga. And it, Tamanga. It's, labeled as, it's labeled as unusual circumstances uh, because there's, a, apparently this was a very prominent dynasty in in things and it was like you know mary in uh unfortunately it didn't work out too well at the height of his popularity like i said he was making two feature films a year following the age of our hospitality 1923 navigator 1924 the general 1926 the latter two he regarded as his best films so he really took pride in what he did. After a few more silent films, including Coolidge, uh, or sorry, College and Steamboat Jr., Keaton was informed that his contract had been sold by his brother-in-law and producer. Keaton regarded that as the worst mistake of his life. Because what he lost was, before that, he had creative control. Now, when he went there, it was like, yeah, I make more money, but I lose all my creative control. It, it you know, that'll, uh, that'll do it for you. Um, and he was fired by MGM because he, uh, after a while. Sorry, guys, like I said, I'm not feeling the greatest so i'm bringing my i'm trying to bring my a game uh let's see what was it his first film with the mgm was the cameraman in 1928 which was regarded as one of the best silent comedies 
But the release significantly lost control of Keaton having his ability to, you know, control what he was doing. At which makes me wonder if it was possibly an ego issue. Uh, after his, uh, after the MGM thing, he, uh, his wife sued him for divorce. And man, you want to talk about putting somebody through the ringers. She, he, he was depressed and he was just like, okay, fine, I guess. And she uh, took the kids, took the house. He lost virtually everything. And she even changed the name, the last name of the kids to her maiden name. It would be 10 years later before when they were of age that they could reconnect with their father. Which is something that kind of sp spoke to me. Um, after that point, uh, Chaplin, or sorry, not Chaplin, Keaton goes into a state of alcoholism, kind of like his father. And he goes into a rehab clinic and kind of has a Florence Nightingale thing with, uh, Jack, you don't have to worry about trying to keep up with the, the timeline. I'm not, I'm not going to fault you for that. Because I didn't get it set up as best I could. No but worries. I mean, I'll just yeah. keep. I'll just try to get all along. No, no, no worries. No worries at all. In fact, let me blow this up so it looks better. But um, you know he he got divorced. He got depressed. He went to a ward for alcoholism met his second wife had kind of a floor night scale incident and after three years he he divorced her again uh it wasn't until he uh met his third wife that's why i said third time's a charm she <laughs> stayed with him until the end of his uh until the end of his life and uh when i put hard m marks that was uh Sorry, I'm trying to find this stuff. Um, he went to work for the Marx Brothers. And he just... Uh, guys, I'm sorry. I'm not... I, I, I'm not... I'm just not there. My apologies. Um, he, in 1940, he met and married his third wife, Eleanor. Uh, this would be, a, I think, a changing point for him because he stayed with her, and like I said, until his death. And uh, when he, he actually transitioned into talkies, but there were very few and far between for that. But what was really interesting I'm just going to go this is Okay, yeah, this is where I'm going to end with this. His last film work was Railroad 1969, but because the it was such a short film, it was released before other movies. Like a funny thing happened on the way to the forum 1966. Let's go. One of the things was after he did his final films, uh, especially kind of it reunited an idea of these people to understand silent films. And he spent the rest of his life uh, basically doing interviews and stuff. And uh, Uh, like I said, he, uh, had a hell of a, damn it. 
It's okay, man. Nah, okay. I'm sorry, guys. I meant to. I meant to bring. I. I, I was desperately trying to bring my A game for this. I didn't want to cancel again. But uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, all three of these had was different things. Like uh, Charlie Chapman had a very successful career. Shirley Temple had a very good child career. Um, Buster Keaton seems like the one who had the most inroads, you know, those bumps and curves and stuff. So anyway, I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> we're going to have to call it because, uh, I'm about done. I apologize. Okay. I, I apologize, Jack. I apologize, Alicia. I really was hoping that I could be a little more healthier for this, but it's okay. Don't worry. Yeah, you just yeah, take care of well, well, unfortunately, I don't get to control what nature does. Sure. Wait a minute. What the fuck is this? <laughs> Who did this? What the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> All right, guys. Anyway, uh, so what do you guys think about doing? Uh, you guys seem to be on board. My wife, you know, my wife Rachel mentioned women in history behind the camera. I think we're gonna have a great time next week, okay. and I promise I'll be healthier. <laughs> All right, everybody who's watching, everybody in the chat, you take care to the troll who came in. Whatever, nobody cares about your Russian shit. <laughs> Peace out.